things that you cannot see, okay? Love, peace, joy, spiritual things. This is a verse in the Bible that says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law, okay, from Psalms 119. And that's what we're going on today, that you will see wonderful things from God. Let us all stand together, and we're going to sing our opening uh, hymn. Okay. Ching the God, hail up. 56. Here we go. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name. Second verse. Unresting, unhasting, and silent. We have some kneelers. If you like to kneel and pray, otherwise, please be seated. Ching cha. Okay. We're going to uh, sing our uh, call to worship together, and uh, then we'll be praying. All right. Let's pray together. Oh, Father in heaven, almighty God, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this opportunity to sit before you and kneel before you and acknowledge you as God, that you are the supreme being. You are the master of the universe. You are the prince of peace and the king of kings, and everything is under your control. Help us, Lord, to learn to know you today, to, to, to experience your love, to feel your acceptance, and to worship you this morning. We thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son Jesus uh, to earth to set an example, and more importantly, to die for our sins, that our sins might be forgiven, that we might get to know you as a true God, and that uh, we can have a real relationship with you. We thank you, Lord, this morning that you are here, and that you're here to, you are here to accept our worship. We pray, Lord, that our, you would cleanse our lives and uh, may our worship be holy before you. And now we pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. 
Uh, welcome, everybody. Fun ying, fun ying. All right, this is our bulletin. We have this every Sunday. And um, uh, on, oops, <laughs> on the left hand side is our, our worship. Okay, these are all the things that we we're doing, and it tells you when to stand up, when to sit down. And, you know, if you can't understand what I'm saying, you can you maybe be able to read it. Okay. Uh, every Sunday we have our English worship at 11:15. Moi ga lai ba yat ngai de yo gong dong hua sap tim jung hai ni bin and then pu tong hua hai 501 Cambridge. Okay, so all right, so this is the English worship, so I'm just going to speak English. All right, uh, we're going to sing a song. It's called "Open the Eyes of My Heart." Okay, very simple song. And it is a request to God to open our eyes to the unseen world, okay? The, the place where God resides. We're singing to God right now. We're worshiping God, and He's invisible, okay? So you have physical eyes to see the physical things, like where you drive and what you eat and reading and television and internet and all that stuff, okay? But there are things that you cannot see. They're invisible. They're beyond uh, the, our five senses, Okay? And that's what we're talking about. Open the eyes of my head. No, open the eyes of my heart. Okay? There's a lot of things you feel and you sense that you cannot explain. Okay? These are things of the inner spirit. These are things of the soul. And that's what we're singing. We're asking God to open the eyes of our heart. Okay? All right, here we go. eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Once again, from the top. Okay, everybody try singing it. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Okay, that's God. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. That's the whole message, okay? That you come here this morning, you want, you're asking God, help me. I cannot see, okay? I'm blind to these wonderful things. These wonderful things that you, 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 you created for us. These thing, wonderful relationships that you have. These wonderful things that we have. And we're asking God, to open the eyes of our heart, to see it, because it's all around. God is doing wonderful things, but sometimes we just don't know it, okay? It's like some people get sick, they don't know their nose is running, okay? They don't know they got a big pimple here, okay? They don't know that cholesterol's building up inside, okay? They don't know that they're overdoing their, or they're overeating. They don't see it because they're not, their eyes are not open, okay? So this song says, Open my eyes to the invisible things around, the things that are most important, the things that last for eternity. We're going to sing it again, okay? Open the eyes. Open your mouth. Open the eyes of my heart.
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Very good singing. I hope you like the song. Okay, right now, according to schedule, we're going to look at the Apostles' Creed. It will be printed on the screen, and it's also printed here. And this is what our church believes, and this is most Christians uh, acknowledge this creed, and it tells you about that spiritual kingdom that we believe in, okay? Uh, let's all stand together. Uh, I can't read English anyway. Okay, you want to read it or say it together, all right? Here we go. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Ching Chong. Part of our worship um, is to give to God. Okay, we sing to God, but we also give uh, our, our, our finances to God. Okay, so I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward to receive any gifts, any offerings, any tithes that you would want to give to God this morning. Okay, ushers? You may take this time to pray. Or just meditate. Think about the spiritual things, the things of the soul, and ask God to open the eyes of your heart. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us and caring for us and doing all the things that are for our benefit. We want to uh, let you know that we appreciate the life, the homes, the jobs, the friendships, the love that you allow us to experience every day. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I think we're a little early. Caleb, are they out there yet? No. Oh. Okay. Um, there is a song I would like to introduce to you. It's not written in the bulletin, but we'll put it, put it right, right in right now, okay? Uh, it's on uh, page 522 in the hymnal, okay? And the idea here is that God is always watching. God is always taking care of us. And he does things in his time, okay? Sometimes we're a little impatient. We want to have things like right now or like yesterday or we want it tomorrow. But God has a long-range plan for us. Uh, don't have to worry if you put your trust in God, okay? 
Uh, the Bible says, lean not on your own understanding in his time. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. for a parking space at Trader Joe's yesterday and my wife was just amazed that I just slowed down, I paused for a minute, moment and then the car pulled out, okay? And that has happened so many times, you know, just, just a mat. Otherwise, I was at, uh, uh, was it Pacific Super down at uh, St. Francis and uh, the Southgate? And I drove around and around and around and around and, and it just, it was impossible to find a space. It took me about 10, 15 minutes to find a space, okay. Timing's everything. When I, when I really need a space, it, it gets there, okay. And when I don't, not urgent, God just lets me drive around in a circle and a circle. And, and that's life, right? All right. Today, don't forget, wherever you park in the city, um, there's no more warnings, okay. Uh, you're going to get a ticket if your meter expires, okay? I'll be going down to Chinatown later on, and a lot of my friends are, and um, you got to watch those meters, okay? The law changes. It's all God's timing, all right? We're going to sing the first verse again, all right? And remember, what, whatever it is in your life, okay, whether it's medical or whether it's educational or whether it's your love life or whether it's fixing your house or your children, whatever, talk to God and let Him take control. He will make it right in his time. First verse. In his time. Hi, Randy. Are they here yet? Uh, yes? No, we have a special choir uh, anthem today. Okay, so it's not God's timing yet. That means he wants you to sing a little more, okay? All right, so we're going to sing the second verse. And I forgot to tell you, God's not so concerned. He didn't give us all operatic voices, okay? Uh, I was watching, during the Christmas vacation, I saw La Miserale, okay? And I saw the play like 10 years ago, or the music, you know, and they were doing you know, great opera singers back there when I went down to Gary Street and all that and saw it. But this movie, La Miserale, uh, is different. They weren't great singers. They were okay singers. But the whole role in the theater, you know, not only just my friends, we were all crying, okay? We cried song after song after song and because it shows it we can identify with that, okay? That that the everyday life sometimes is not easy. And God will help us through the, the miserable times in our lives, okay? 
So timing's really uh, everything, and uh, God has his timing. We're going to uh, sing the first verse again, okay? Because the, the key word here is that he's teaching us every day his ways, okay? Here we go, first verse again. In your time, in your time, sing it out. Normally in our worship, we allow people to stand up and share about things that are happening in their lives and how God does things. So we have several people that we need to pray for because their, their health is not good. We have, a, we have a family who just lost a loved one uh, last week. And uh, we're going to take time to just pray for, for you and all these people coming. All right, let's have a quick prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a loving God, and you know everything that's going on in our lives, the wonderful things, the not so wonderful things. We pray, Lord, that you would open up our spiritual eyes to see your hand working in our lives, in our families, in our coworkers, uh, all the people around us. Help us, Lord, to see your hand working. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'd like you to welcome our primary cornerstone, <laughs> primary school cornerstone choir. They'll be singing a song to you called, I Want to Bless You, Lord. Okay, let's welcome them as they sing for us. They're still coming. Right? You want to encourage them while they're young to to sing and sing and sing, okay?
Amen. Amen. Thank you, children. Yeah, they did a good job. And it is true what they were singing, right? That God does want to bless us. But as Reverend Fong was pointing out as well, in his time. Uh, we've been going on since the beginning of the year, the beginning of 2013, just talking about a few different things. We started off this, the year um, mentioning in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the idea of reconciliation and how God wants us as Christians to be involved as ministers of reconciliation. That's what God is doing here in the world. He's presenting his message through his church, i.e. not just the building, but the people, uh, to communicate the gospel. And the next week we talked about pressing on to super maturity because even though the Apostle Paul had been walking with Jesus all his life, he kept on wanting to know God more and more. And it was an encouragement to us to keep on pressing on. Last week we looked at 1 Timothy and, and how the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy, you know, you need to fan into flame uh, the gift that God has given you. And the way that that happens or the way that that works is by being involved, not shrinking back from the work that God has given us, not shrinking back from the ministry God has given us, but being involved into, into it more and more. And so having said all of those things and starting off the year that way with the normal congregation, and I recognize we have fifth grade parents who are here who aren't, some of you aren't normally here on Sundays, I just wanted to review a little bit and then just hit this idea that's really important for us. Because as we get into here and we talk about, um, you know, pressing on and being involved in the ministry of reconciliation and and fanning into flame the gift that God has given to us, we, we need to have the right heart in all of that. Because sometimes we can just get caught up into the list of do's and don'ts or a list of trying to please God or something like that. And the idea is that God loves us and God wants us to love him too. And the way that he wants us to show our love for him is to be expressed through obedience. Now that's a, a principle that goes throughout the Bible. So this morning we're going to spend some time looking in the Old Testament uh, about uh, a passage of scripture that was given to the Israelites before they entered the promised land, but after they had come out of uh, the bondage in Egypt. And so we'll be reading in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, uh, we will have it up on the screen here eventually. Okay? This is, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. I, we're, we are having technical difficulties. It's not on there? Hmm. Okay. Well, how about this? You can memorize it today, okay? No. Let, let's, go with, uh, let's go with the passage here. I'll read it to you. I, I have some slides, but for some reason or another, we're experiencing technical difficulties. Uh, but I'll read it, and I'll keep on reviewing back to the text. If you have iPhones or electronic devices or whatever, you can access you know, a Bible app there, and that would be just fine, too. Uh, and then that way we really don't need the PowerPoint because everyone will have their own technology right there. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4 and going through verse 9. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, this is the word of the Lord. So as the Lord is giving this to uh, his people, uh, the Israelites, I told you that they had come out of bondage in Egypt, and now they had wandered around in the, in the wilderness for a while, and they were getting ready to go into the promised land. And so God was using Moses to give them the law again, or to preach these sermons to them, to make sure they were reminded as they entered into the promised land how they were supposed to behave. And so as he gave them the, these commands, he said, listen to this, I want you to to know these things and I want you to understand how I want you to keep on um, um, perpetuating, if you will, this idea of a covenantal relationship, this idea of being in a relationship with God as his people and how you're to, to perpetuate that from one generation to the next. And so he starts off in verse four 
And he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So it's addressed to Israel, and I told you that already, this, this collective community, these people who, who had been brought out of Egypt. And it was um, a reminder that God is one. And what does that mean? Well, some people, uh, commentators, will look at this and talk about the idea of God being um, one in that he has a triune nature. We call that in the, in the theological circus, circuit circles uh, the Trinity, okay? The idea that God is tri triune in his nature. Um, or three persons. And the idea of this is that you have God revealed as God the Father, you have God revealed as God the Son, and Jesus Christ, God revealed as God the Holy Spirit. And so similar to the three states of matter, some people use that as a way to, to try to understand it. You have, you know, water as the same chemical makeup of H2O, but being water, being vapor or steam, being ice, okay? So that's how some people kind of understand uh, the Trinity, okay? It's just an illustration, it's not exact, but it kind of helps us to understand. And so God is saying here that he's one, but I, I think, you know, having spent the few moments there just talking about the Trinity, I think the idea of what God is saying is that he's the only one, that there's not other gods out there. And he's telling this to the Israelites because they had just come out of Egypt where they had been in, uh, exposed to idolatry there. And they had gone through the wilderness and gone through uh, this area where they had been around people who were uh, idolaters as well. They were going into a land of the people that were uh, being eradicated from the land were idolatrous as well. And God didn't want them to be that way. And so he says, hey, I'm, you know, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And the idea is he's alone as well in this purpose of being one. There's no other gods there. It's not like there's God and there's this other gods. And some people try to do that. And they try to look, look at God that way. They say, uh, if there's some religions that they have the idea that, you know, there are all these different gods out there. And so they make these little idols to, to show that, you know, they, they, recognize this God here and this God here. And a lot of that is, you know, superstition. In the book of Acts in chapter 17, the Apostle Paul was in Greece and while he was there in Athens, he saw all these idols all over the place. And the people had idol here to this person, idol there to this person, idol there to this person. And then they had this little sign and it says, to the unknown God. And it was the idea there that, you know, we might have missed one. And if we get this guy upset, he might come and, and mess us up. So let's just make sure we cover our bases. And so they see God like that. He's one among many. And that's not the testimony of the scriptures. The way God has revealed himself to us is that he is the only God. There's not other gods that are out there. So we don't want to just take God and slap him into some sort of belief system where you have all these other idols in there and, and, and connect them in and say, hey, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I worship God. That's not true worship of God. He's telling this to his people here. So I just kind of want to start off there because that's what the, 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 the text says to us. Moving on from there, it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And some people want to break this up and say, okay, there are different compartments in our lives, you know. There's this mind, there's this strength, there's this, there's this heart type of thing. But the, the idea of the, of the verse is, is to remind us that in our totality of who we are, that all that we're about, supposed to be about is supposed to be to God. It's supposed to be for him. He wants us to love him with all of that. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, sometimes we get caught up in, into these lists of things to do and, and, and don't do. And we can get caught up into thinking, oh, this is what it means to be a Christian. I go to church on Sundays. Uh, I, I read my Bible every so often, maybe sometimes, maybe not. You know, I do this, I do that. I give money to the church, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And, and they think that is what it means to be Christian. But the idea is about loving God with all that we are. So we're not just in this list of, of, of rules, right? We are in a relationship with God. And he wants to emphasize that by saying, love the Lord your God. It's not just about doing a bunch of things. It's about being in this relationship with God. The Old Testament talks about loving God, and this is a New Testament idea as well. So the theme runs throughout the scriptures. And the principle in it is, how do we show God that we love God? The principle to the Israelites was that they were to show God that they love God by being obedient to his commands. In the New Testament, it's the same way. 
Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So our expression of faith and our expression of love to God is in obedience to what he's given to us. Um, looking at this, in the Old Testament, there are some things that were a little bit different. I just thought I'd take a few moments just to, to address this. In the Old Testament, we have this idea of faith. We have that in the New Testament as well, but expressed slightly different, differently. In the Old Testament, you have Abraham, who's this person who God called out of, uh, of, of, of Ur of the Chaldees, a uh, place over there in, uh, in Persia, and says, here, here, here's where you come to now. I'm going to put you into this promised land. And Abraham believed God, even though he didn't know where God was leading him, but he followed. And he trusted God. And the Bible says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So throughout the Old Testament, you have this idea of faith connecting to righteousness, and God wants us to trust him. Remember I told you about this idea of faith? And the way that we show God that we trust him is that we are obey, obedient to him. It's the same way that we show him we love him. We obey his commands. And so in the New Testament, the same idea of faith is there, except for God's commandment is that we express our faith by putting our trust in his son, Jesus Christ. That's how the, 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 the idea is connected from Old and New Testament. So it's not two different ways of salvation. Sometimes people get kind of mixed up about that. It is one way of salvation. It is by faith in God. But in the New Testament, God specifically says that our expression of faith has to be in his son, Jesus Christ. We talk about keeping the commandments of God. In 1 John chapter 3, it talks about keeping the commands of God. And the commands of God are this, or is this, to believe and his one and only son, Jesus Christ. So that's the same sort of you know, idea there in faith. It's the same sort of thing, except for in the New Testament, it's expressed in, in faith in Jesus Christ as a command, as a following of what God has given to us. So I thought I'd just take the time there to just kind of deal with that. Because sometimes people say, well, what about these people? You know, they believe in God, or they believe in God, and what does the Bible have to say about them? The Bible says that only in Jesus Christ is there salvation. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, there's no other name by which men might be saved referring to the name of Jesus Christ. So just kind of getting in there because I want us to understand that the exclusivity of God talked about in the Old Testament is the same exclusivity of God talked about in the New Testament. And the idea of who God is is he continues to stand on the fact that he's the one and only. And he says that this love relationship that we're in with him, he says that we're, it's, we're supposed to love him with all that we are. And then he moves into verse six here and it says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. So he tells us to love him, and he tells us how is it that this love is going to be played out. What's it going to look like? It's going to look like love for God, and this love is going to be shown by us having God's word on our heart. What do we mean by having it in our heart? It's the idea that it's in our life, because a little bit later on, right here after verse 6, it talks about in verse 7 different ways that this word that is in our heart is to be transmitted to the next generation. He says here in verse 6, uh, as I said before, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Verse 7 says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So it's this idea about God's truth being in our lives and coming out in all facets of where we are. When you get up in the morning, when you go to sleep at night, when you're driving to your kids to school, when you're eating around the breakfast table, when you're eating around the dinner table, when you're hanging out after you had a meal or whatever and you're lounging around somewhere, if you should have the blessing of being able to do that, it's those sorts of situations that God's referring to. He's saying, hey, your word, my word is in your heart and it needs to get out to this next generation this way. It's not just, it's not just, about, uh, it's not just about having a... a you know, here, I, and I give this to you, and that's how I transmit the word. It's about living the life so our next generation, our children can see how it is that we're supposed to love God as well. Uh, in verse 7, it says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Other translations, when it says you shall teach them diligently, it says you shall impress these upon your children. 
And the idea is, is, the, is the picture of somebody taking a hammer and a chisel on a piece of stone and just carving into them these things. That's how you transmit the truth of God from one life to the next is by showing it in your own life, living it out and having that to be able to transmit to our kids. See, we're commanded to do this in God's word. Uh, if I just jumped, I mean, if I just stayed in the Old Testament, you'd say, hey, that just applies to Israel. It's just this group of people, God's chosen people. The principle applies because in the New Testament, it tells us in Ephesians chapter six that we have a responsibility as parents to make sure that we teach our children the ways, ways of God. You cannot, you cannot transmit that unless it's in your heart. You're not gonna be able to teach them that. Sometimes people wonder, you know, hey, hey, how do I get this to my kids? The way that you get it in your kids is, is it gotten in you first? Now, I was reading this week here about a guy who did a study. He was a, a professor at a Christian college, and he was going into a, a private um, a primary school, and uh, I guess it went from K to eighth grade, and he went to that school, and he did a little study, and he talked to the kids, and he wanted to, he wanted to find out, and to their families, he wanted to find out how these children, you know, they were gone to a Christian school, kind of like Cornerstone Academy, right? The kids are going to this Christian school and trying to figure out what the parents are doing and, and what their belief system is and what it is they want their kids to get, because within a Christian school, you're going to learn the Christian ways. I mean, that's the whole idea of of, of Cornerstone anyway is that we want to share the love of Jesus Christ with families through excellence in education. And so this guy did this study and he found out that there were all these different things. You know, some parents had their kids memorizing verses. Some parents did these things with their kids. Some parents took their kids to church with them each Sunday and those sorts of things. But they said that the best way, the most consistent way that the, the faith was transmitted to their kids is they saw it lived out in the lives of their parents. It wasn't just, hey, you brought me here and dropped me off, or you brought me here and did this stuff, and you did something completely different than that. It was the idea that they were involved in it as well. And so if we're going to be like that for our children, you know, if we're going to be effective as transmitting this, this body of knowledge, this faith to the next generation, we're going to have to make sure that we got it in our own hearts. That's what we're being challenged with here. Not only within the family setting, but within the church as well. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 says, Go therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very ends of the age. So this idea of teaching them to obey all that I commanded you is something that one generation within the church needs to transmit or pass on to the next generation as well. See, this idea of perpetuating and continuing to grow has to do with it being a living faith in our lives so that we can communicate that to the next generation so that they can see it, they can know what it means to follow after God. See, God wants to be there in all our situations. He wants to be there in our happy times. He wants to, he wants to be there in our sorrowful times. He wants to be there in times of rejoicing and times when it's, when it, when it's sad. He wants to be there in everything. That's why he says, you love me, love me with all your heart. He's not just something that we think about on Sundays or maybe Sunday school or maybe Friday nights if you have fellowship there. God wants to be in our life all the time. That's the idea of, of it being in all of our hearts, right? Our heart, soul, mind, and strength, the totality of who we are. And so as he says these things, he says, here, you know, you get the word into your heart you live it out, and you can transmit it to the next generation. Even then, there is still this intentionality that takes place. He says in verse 8 and verse 9, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So some of the Jewish people took this and, and took it literally. And so what they would do is they would put these little pouches here that had uh, scripture verses in them and they would tie them around their hands or some of them would tie them around their heads. People would write them on the doorposts of their house. People would write them on the, the gates of their cities. And the idea is it says here, you shall bind them as a sign 
on your hand. The idea that as you con connect with these words, this truth, it's that your life is, is, is under the authority of this truth. You are living by this truth. And as Christians, we have the same idea, right? We're supposed to live under the authority of God's word. And we know his word. One of the ways that we know his word is we memorize his word, right? We memorize it so it can get into our minds, it can get into our hearts. We still have to keep on applying it in different areas of our lives. But we need to know what it is first. That's why we spend the time studying it as well. And the idea of having his word is it's, it's to show who we are so that it will be a sign. It's a symbol of what we're about. See, if we go through life and we say, hey, I'm a Christian, and we never talk about God, and we never let the word of God penetrate into our lives. We're never acting on it. We say, hey, I go to church on Sunday and I go to Sunday school and, and I've heard that stuff. But when it comes time to doing my business, I'm completely different than what a Christian perspective is. I'm not honest in my dealings. I cheat people and stuff like that. Then, then we're not living by this. We're deceiving ourselves. And that's not what God has called us to do. God has called us to love him with all that we are. I'm going to move on here. I think the idea here of also of uh, talking about these things when we rise up and when we go to sleep and when we walk along the way and everything like that is within the, the church especially. We need to encourage each other with these words that God has given us. So those things are happening, right? Those words are being applied into our lives and we have opportunities to share them with one another. One of the things that Reverend Fong talks about is on, on these Sunday things when we have school children come in here and sing, we have to kind of adjust the schedule because there's not enough time to inc incorporate all the, the items in our, our normal worship service. So we have to address that a little bit and we have to, we have to tweak that. So one of the things that we, one of the things we, we cut out on these Sundays is the sharing time. And I know why we do it, and I know why we have to do it. But the other times in the month we have these sharing times, this opportunities for us to share about what God is doing in our lives with one another because that's part of communicating the truth of who God is to us as well. That's an opportunity to encourage one another with the things that God is doing in our lives. Right? That's why we do it. And it's great, and we need that. Because sometimes you're thinking, oh, you know what, I hear the pastor up there, and you know, Pastor Scott, he's like that, and he always does that, and nah, nah. but that's not me. I'm different. I'm just the person who sits in the pew. Until you find out there are other people who sit in the pew, and they got things going on in their lives. And you find out that God is working through them as well. And here you sit down and talk with me, and we talk about our kids together. You find out we have some of the same challenges. Right? There's nobody's who arrived yet. We are all works in progress. And we need to be reminded of that on a regular basis, that God is being patient and God is continuing to work through us and work in us to bring about his purposes. And we need to encourage one another with these words. I'm going to jump here because um, we're getting close to where we need to be. Uh, Verse 9 says, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It's this idea, once again, of identifying with these things, of being reminded of them on a regular basis. You know, one of the things that um, you get in these whole principles here of going down from uh, verses 7 to verse 9 is this idea of repetition. You know, first of all, uh, one person has noted that, you know, each new day brings opportunities. So regardless of where you are in this transmittal process, maybe you haven't been talking about that much with your kids. Maybe you say, hey, you know, I know my faith, I know it's real, and I, haven't, I, I really haven't been talking that much about it with my kids. You know, I kind of let the church do all that. Hey, you, each new day gives you an opportunity to be able to, to share with your children what God is doing, okay? Second thing about this is that, is that this idea of repetition comes in. It's not something that you just talk about once, are talking about once in a while. It's the idea is that it's, it's permeating, God's truth is permeating your life and it's just kind of spilling over into whatever you're doing. And it's really important because sometimes, especially parents, we, we worry about this. Some, some parents are known to nag, 
Okay? We just keep on telling our kids the same thing over and over again. And the kids go, ah, I heard it, I heard it, I heard it. Some kids are really stubborn. Okay? Maybe your kid is really stubborn. <laughs> and you think, ah, oh, you know, I have to keep telling them over and over. And they say, ah, oh, I know it, I heard it, I heard it, I heard it. They might still need to hear it. Right? Sometimes we don't say it enough. You know, some guy was talking about, you know, just communicating some ideas within the church. And uh, he, he was a pastor in another church. And he said, you know, when I talk about something and, I, and I, I, I really feel like this is what God wants us to do in our church and I, and I talk about it, he says, I, I, I keep on talking about it. And I used to think when I was younger that I would just say it once or twice and people would catch it. But he said, I realize I have to keep on going on and on and on about it on a regular basis till my staff hears it and they can actually finish the words as I'm saying them, you know? So you might have some things like that with your kids where you're reminding them all the time of things that they need to do. You know, be safe, stay out of trouble when you give them the keys to the car. Don't speed, right? Watch out for this. Don't stay out late at night. And sometimes they're walking out the door and you start and they finish. You know what I mean? If your kids aren't that old yet, it, it can happen, okay? It can happen. Yeah, 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 they shake their head. But they need to hear that, you know? And like I was telling you about this pastor and he kept on saying, he says it wasn't until his staff got it, right? And then he realized by the time they got it, then maybe it was trickling down to the congregation. You see what I mean? We just kind of assume, especially fathers. Some of us are, are, are you know, I don't know about you. I, you might think I like to talk. I'm a pretty quiet guy at home, right? I only have, you know, <laughs> in the premarital counseling, they go through this thing and they tell you that, you know, each, each woman, she can say, like, she's got 25,000 words a day she can go through. Not, not different words, but that's how many she says. Man, 12,500. Mm -hmm. So I, I use all mine outside, you know. <laughs> when I come home, I just try to be a good listener, okay? Yes, honey. Yes, honey, you know. Right? And so sometimes we think, hey, you know, sometimes we think, uh, you know, men, uh, I just need to say it once and my kids get it. You know, you might say it in such a way that it scares them because of your voice and who you are and everything like that. But they still might need to hear it more than that. Because this idea of repetition is very foundational to teaching, right? You just keep going. You have to keep, say it, say it again, say it a different way, say it again, say it again, again. Say them what you did, tell them what you just told them type of thing, you know, right? Because that's kind of how it works. Why? Because sometimes we don't get it. And God knows that it's not just about kids, it's about adults as well, right? We keep needing to be reminded of God's goodness, of his grace, of how he's working in our lives to bring about his purposes, about what he wants to accomplish in this world so that we can stay focused on that. All that he's telling us to do here with all those things is he wants us to be obedient, to show that we love him. Why? Because we're trusting him. We're saying, okay, God, I love you. I know you know what's best. I'm gonna do what you asked me to do. If we have some problems with that, we can take that up with him. God, it seems like you want me to do this, but if I do that, that means this is gonna have to happen. And if that happens, then this is gonna have to happen. Is that really what you want me to do, God? Because I wanna be obedient. And we can ask God those sorts of things and we can get confirmation with him. And he's willing to take us down that path. Why? Because more and more what he wants to do with us is conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ, to make us more and more like Christ and his character and his morality and everything that he is. This is what God wants to do with us. He wants us to express our love for him in obedience. So let's do that. As we, are, as we are being ministers of reconciliation, as we are pressing on to super maturity in Christ, as we are fanning the flame of our gift into, into a big fire for God, let's make sure that all of that is motivated with the love of God so that as we do these right things, we can enjoy the blessings that come from God, doing the right things for all the right reasons. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for being good to us and for the reminder in your word, God, that you want us to keep on with your word. You want us to love you with all that we are, Lord, with the totality of who we are, and that love is expressed in obedience to your ways. 
uh, that obedience requires faith as well, Lord. And so we continue to please you as you tell us in the scriptures. It is impossible to please you without faith. We continue to please you as we step out in faith, loving you, God, walking in your ways, obeying your ways. And we want to do this, Lord, because you tell us this is what is best. And as we seek what is best, as we seek your ways, God, I pray that you continue to work in our lives that the next generation might know you and love you as well. Thanks for this reminder this morning. Just bless us as we continue to worship you together here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, Reverend Fong had to leave because he has a funeral to, uh, to be at. So I'm gonna continue on here. Um, ushers, uh, who is that? Uh, Barry, would you like to uh, introduce our guest? Yes, sir, Reverend Crook. At this time, I'd like to ask all of the friends and family of the Cornerstone Academy fifth graders to stand up and be welcome and be greeted. Thank you for coming. Fifth graders, Eric. You stand up. Welcome. Thank you for coming. If there are any other guests that you have brought today, you may introduce them at this time. Thank you. Okay. We're going to continue now with the announcements that we have as we get the, the fifth graders are getting ready now and they're all lined up. Uh, announcements. Do we have um, slides on that? You're going to, I have a controller. Okay, here we go. Happy New Year. Okay. Um, Plan for your giving in 2013. There are offering envelopes available outside in the rotunda, and there's a request form as well for, uh, I think you should have already filled that out to get a receipt from last year. Uh, so uh, you can plan out your, <coughs> your giving for 2013 by getting offering envelopes, and that way you can have that all uh, set before you even come into service on Sundays. Okay, uh, next announcement. We continue to have uh, the workshops, I believe, uh, is this next week, the, the last week? John Marr? Yes, it is, okay. So this is our last week of the, um, the band workshop, so you can uh, learn, uh, it says here, guitar, electric guitar, drums, keyboard, and bass guitar. Are you doing just one of those this upcoming week? Which one is that? Electric guitar. So if you wanna be a rocker, you can come on out here, okay? All right, Saturday, it's free from 10 to 12 noon, okay? Um, oh, here it is. That's all I have. The rest of the announcements you can read in the announcement. Let's welcome our fifth graders who are coming in now. You need a mic? Um,
welcome. My name is Florence e, and I hope you enjoyed our first song titled, Oh This God. He is an amazing God and we hope that you are as excited as we are to call upon his name through songs. In Genesis, we as the fifth grade learned that the people began to call upon the name of the Lord after the first murder in history. This shows me that in the depth of sin, we can call upon our God who is so beautiful and only his light can stamp out the darkness. So our second song for today is called Beautiful. Perhaps you'll recognize the melody, though the lyrics are original. Feel free to sing along with the lyrics, which will be on the screen. Our last song is called Rain in Us. Psalm 99 says, The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion, he is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name, he is holy. Praise God that he is perfect and reigns over all.
But we've been at this for a while. I didn't have to say anything. You just knew we were just going to keep on cheering them on as they, they leave. They did a fantastic job. Amen. That was great. Um, we hope that you can come and, and worship with us if you don't have a place to worship on a regular basis uh, for anybody who's here. And um, we're going to stand right now. We're going to sing our doxology. And, and then I will I'll dismiss you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming out here. I think your children are going to be in the cafetorium, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, to your right as you exit this room. Have a good week.